This is Historian Splaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. As I record this particular podcast, you probably know both the United States and Great Britain are embroiled right now in constitutional crises, where different parties are fighting and struggling over whether the chief executives of these two countries overstepped their proper executive authority, abused their power, broke uh, laws or accepted norms and precedents. And in a lot of ways, the conflict that's going on in the United States really reflects and echoes our, our British heritage, where those same sorts of questions have been hashed out and sometimes broken out into open fighting repeatedly through the centuries. And I talked a bit about the present day sort of Brexistential crisis that has engulfed Great Britain. I talked about that some on the other podcast that I collaborate on called Mass of Contradictions. So I'll put the link to that in the description. But I mentioned in that discussion that a lot of what's going on now between Parliament and the Prime Minister and the Queen and the courts can really only be understood if you look back at what happened in the 1600s when these questions about the powers of Parliament and where does sovereignty rest and what is the relationship between the executive and Parliament, when all of that was fought out and literally came to blows on the battlefield more than once, but most dramatically in the English Civil War in the 1640s. And it just so happens that I was already planning anyway. It's very you know, serendipitous. I was already planning to do another lecture on the history of England about the Stuarts and the 1600s and the power struggles between the different classes and parties during the Stuart age as a follow-up on my earlier lecture about the Tudors, right, the previous dynasty. So I guess it happens that the news just kind of happened to flare up around these same constitutional issues uh, just in time to promote my latest installment. So I hope you find it topical and maybe clarifying. But I'm going to look at this not simply from a, a legal perspective, you know, I'm not a lawyer or a legal scholar, but a historian. I'm going to look at this from a social and political point of view and see how these issues, these recurring issues about who has ultimate power over war and peace, over money and taxes, uh, over land, all of this came out of the sort of unresolved problems and tensions that existed already earlier in the Elizabeth period, but that were kind of papered over and left unsolved and then sort of burst open again after Elizabeth was gone. Okay, so as I said, I left off earlier with the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, and she was a ruler who had managed to build a sort of workable enough consensus around questions of religion, the so-called Elizabethan religious settlement, and who had built up the, the wealth, the power of the English government, uh, even as she then spent much of that capital and political capital uh, on foreign wars and conflicts, uh, and who died in 1603 with no issue to succeed her. And so the throne passed to her relative, King James of Scotland, who was the son of her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, but who, unlike Mary, was a Protestant, had been raised and educated in the Protestant faith. So when James comes to the throne, uh, this marks a tremendous political turning point for the, all of the British Isles, not just for England, because now for the first time you have the same individual ruler recognized as the legitimate monarch of both England and Scotland at once. And at the same time, Ireland was also a satellite kingdom with its own separate laws and parliament and all of that, but under the control of the English crown. So when James 
succeeds Elizabeth in 1603, he becomes for the first time the sole ruler of all three kingdoms of all of the British Isles, England, Scotland, and Ireland. And reportedly, as he is traveling down the road in a sort of royal entourage through Scotland uh, in order to go down and take his throne at Westminster, he reportedly told the entourage to stop when they reached the border. And he got out of his carriage and lay down in the road across the border and said, in my person, these two kingdoms are one, right? So he had a great sense of drama and he was a theatrical person and he understood the sort of momentousness of this occasion. And basically the rest of the Stuart age, all the rest of the 1600s, you can see in some ways as a kind of ongoing struggle for the Stuart kings to manage these three different kingdoms. And by and large, they did a pretty poor job of it, right? And more than one Stuart king was overthrown. So it was a very rocky, tumultuous time, even as nonetheless, the kingdom of England continued in some ways to prosper and to grow as a European power, right? So there was some success at the same time that there was frequent internal strife, chaos, and even civil war. And on the one hand, as I said, you can see this series of disasters as a result of the Stuarts' failure to manage the three different kingdoms against one another and to balance their interests. But really, I would say that it was more a result of the lingering internal divisions within each of these kingdoms. So just to briefly summarize what these sorts of divisions were, if we look first at Scotland, which is where the Stuarts came from, Scotland was a very divided kingdom. On the one hand, it had been for centuries a very isolated fringe kingdom on the outer edge of Europe. It is a lot of rugged terrain uh, and a lot of old customs and traditions and lifeways, particularly the Celtic lifeways of the Scottish Highlands, persisted on up through the Stuart era. But at the same time, the Scottish lowlands, so the sort of flatter areas around the central belt and eastern coast of Scotland, that's where you find the towns of Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen. Uh, these areas became very commercial and very connected to the rest of Europe. They became comparatively more cultured, more prosperous, more cosmopolitan than even most of England. So Scotland became a highly forward-looking and international kingdom at the same time that it was still a very isolated and even from the point of view of the lowlands, a backwards kingdom when you looked at the highlands and the islands to the north and west, right? So there's this extreme divide between the highlands and the lowlands. And for the most part, the highlands remain mostly Roman Catholic through the Reformation. And even as Protestantism became the official religion of the kingdom, the highlanders remained mainly Catholic, mainly Gaelic speaking, Right? So a local Celtic language that was unknown in the rest of Britain. And they continued to follow the customs of uh, tribal rule, uh, leadership by clan elders and lairds or, or lords of clans, justice dispensed by the lairds or their proxies, uh, communal ownership of land, communal ownership of a lot of livestock, uh, and the livelihood was based in large part on small farming and cattle. Uh, and so this was still really a world that was a throwback not only to the Middle Ages, but even you could say in some ways to the pre-Roman Celtic age. And it was looked on with sort of curiosity, but also horror by their fellow Scots in the lowlands who were much more urban, very literate, educated, uh, who came to speak English, 
uh, you know, Scots, which is actually a, just a northern dialect of, of English, became the main language in those lowland towns. And the lowlands became Protestant, right? Uh, the Scottish church was seized by a group of reformers called the Lords of the Congregation in Edinburgh and was reformed to become a Calvinist Presbyterian church and probably was really the, the church most closely based on the actual teachings and writings of Calvin outside of Geneva. So Scotland was, was already divided by the time King James came to power there. Ireland was also severely divided and a terribly unequal society. You had a, a divide between the elite and the peasantry, and the elites were mostly of English or Norman extraction originally, and they were mostly Protestant. Not all, but they were largely Protestant, and they had a Church of Ireland, as they called it, which was modeled and patterned on the Anglican Church of England. While meanwhile, the, the peasantry, the people who did not own land, who had to pay rents to the landlords, were mainly Catholic and mainly Gaelic speaking, right? Spoke a, a Gaelic language very similar to the Scottish Gaelic of the Scottish Highlands. So in some ways, there was even more of a stark and bitter divide there between the different classes and groups in Ireland. And meanwhile, uh, there was a gradual migration also of Scottish and Northern English Presbyterian colonists who migrated across and settled in Ulster, the county in the northeastern corner of Ireland. And in some ways, they formed a kind of third party. They were not Anglican wealthy landowners and, and nobles, like the old uh, upper class of Ireland. They also were not Catholic peasants. They were sort of a whole different third element unto themselves, and there was a lot of shifting power and shifting alliances among these three groups in Ireland. So this is already a very dangerous, unstable situation to begin with, already by the early 1600s. And then meanwhile, England. Okay, England, of course, is much bigger than Scotland or Ireland. It is decidedly the senior partner. It is the real center of power and wealth and politics and diplomacy. It has a much bigger population. And when James comes to the English throne, he permanently relocates to Westminster. And really, for all intents and purposes, his court at Westminster becomes the real capital of all of the British Isles. The other kingdoms become irrelevant, right, and too minor for James or his successors to really bother with. They rarely ever even visited. But England, of course, was also deeply divided, but in a way that might have been easier to miss. Okay, so Elizabeth had created, on the one hand, in terms of religion, she'd created a Church of England under her leadership as the monarch that was governed by a series of bishops, and that in various ways, in terms of its worship style, could resemble Catholicism somewhat, right? The priests wore priestly vestments. They had a book of common prayer, right? A set shared liturgy. But their teachings and doctrines were basically down the line reformed Protestant, right? Not all that different from what would have been taught or preached in a Presbyterian church in Scotland or a Dutch Reformed or Swiss Reformed church. So it was this funny sort of hybrid creation, right? Its own kind of variety of, of Protestantism that was, that many theologians called a middle way, a via media, a sort of compromise between Reformed Protestantism and Catholicism. And this had managed to sort of keep things reasonably harmonious during Elizabeth's reign, but there were some uh, discontented parties on either extreme that didn't accept this Elizabethan settlement in one way or another. So there were still some Roman Catholics, and Elizabeth's government banned Catholicism in the sense that no public Catholic worship was allowed, no Catholic clergy were allowed in the country, and some Catholic clergy that set foot in the country anyway, such as Jesuit missionaries, 
would be executed if they were caught, and many were executed during Elizabeth's reign. So Catholicism became an underground religion practiced mainly privately or secretly in the homes of powerful and wealthy people who had the space and who had the political clout to get away with it, right? And so it survived among the upper class and landowners, especially in the north and west of the country. There were areas like Lancashire in the northwest where there were still significant numbers of Catholics, and it was those upper class gentry and their clients, right, tenants or servants in their households who could enjoy the protection of these Catholic uh, nobles and landowners, okay? So you have Roman Catholics on one side, and then on the other end, you have uh, various sort of radical separatist groups, also largely underground, who want a more thorough reformation. And within the Church of England, you have a significant wing or party of people who came to be called Puritans, okay? And that was not their own name for themselves. That's what they were called. And it was not a very nice name, but it, was, it sort of means like purists. There were Puritans who sometimes also could just be called godly Protestants, they might call themselves, or hot Protestants was a kind of informal phrase for them. And they were people who believed the Church of England was too close to Catholicism. It was not thoroughly reformed enough, and they wanted to cleanse out uh, what they saw as the vestiges of Catholicism, and that included things like the priestly vestments, uh, the Book of Common Prayer. They wanted to throw out this liturgy and instead have spontaneous prayer and preaching based on the Bible. Some of them wanted to either weaken or even abolish the bishops, right, and have the church be governed democratically from the ground up, which was more of the accepted model among Reformed Protestants, right? And they saw the, the episcopacy, this rule by bishops, as a vestige of the Catholic church. This religious divide was very important, and all sorts of people took different sides in this uh, religious push and pull for different reasons. So you had some who became Puritan, and some who rejected the Puritan arguments and who preferred to keep this more elaborate ceremonial style of worship. And these people came to be called High Church Anglicans. Okay, so we can talk about High Church Anglicans, and many of them, like the Catholics, many of these High Church Anglicans also were nobles or aristocrats, people with land, people connected to traditional rural life, and their clients who depended on them, right? Whereas the Puritans had a very different social profile. Some of them were aristocrats, there were some, some were poor, but they tended largely to be middle class. They were people who were gaining wealth and benefiting from the growing commerce right, the, the growth of commercial towns. They tended to be urban people. They tended to be very literate, right, people with some schooling who could read the Bible and felt that worship should be based more around reading and texts instead of rituals and images, right? So they were literate people. They were middle class. They were what, you know, a Marxian historian might call bourgeois, and they tended to favor very strict morals, right? Disapproval of any sort of public displays of sex, uh, disapproval of swearing, theater, dancing, all these things that, that many people considered sort of signs of loose morals and that they, that they associated with Catholic Europe. And these same sort of things had been prohibited in other Calvinist societies, like in Geneva, right? Geneva was a very strict sort of reformed Protestant utopia where there was, you know, no drinking, no gambling, no dancing, curfews, and all of this. So the religious divide that kind of festered under the surface during Elizabeth's reign really reflected in a lot of ways a class divide, right? And a divide between two very different faces of England, the sort of new, growing, commercial, urban England, centered in London and the port towns in the south and east, versus 
the more sort of traditional, in some ways more medieval, rural England, the England of the the shires, right, of the north and the west country. Okay, and all of these divides I've been talking about in England and Scotland and Ireland, they're all a little bit different, but they have some similarities, right? You can see people like the Puritans in England, the lowland Protestants in Scotland, the Ulster Presbyterian colonists in Ireland that have some similar views and come from similar kinds of backgrounds and could sometimes align with one another. And that's part of why the whole situation in the 1600s was so unstable, because any of these sort of bitter disputes that could come up over religion or politics could sometimes spill over across the boundaries of these different kingdoms, and all kinds of parties could come into play across the borders. Okay, so this is just a little profile of of the, the situation when James comes to power in 1603. And James was a firm Protestant, right? That was his upbringing and he believed in it. He wanted people to uh, observe Protestant worship, to teach Protestant doctrines, and to read and learn from the Bible in English. This is why he sponsored a massive uh, project to create a new translation of the Bible in English verse and employed all kinds of talented poets uh, and translators to create this Bible in 1611, which we now know as the King James Bible. He aligned with certain parties in Parliament. He respected the power and authority of Parliament, much as Elizabeth had before him, right? Elizabeth, by the end of her reign, was very deferential to the authority of Parliament, particularly the House of Commons, where these new rising middle classes, mercantile and professional classes, had a voice. Uh, So he uh, made allies in the House of Commons, and he pursued certain projects that were amenable to these parties in Parliament, such as supporting overseas colonization, right? So in 1607, you get the first successful English transplantation in America, and that's what we call Jamestown. Now, Elizabeth, as I said, and her government had instituted laws suppressing Roman Catholicism, right? And people had been required by law to attend Protestant worship services, and if they did not, they were called a recusants. That's the technical name for them. And recusants had to pay uh, penalties and fines, and they were not allowed to vote or hold political office, right? So that, for instance, the House of Commons, which was elected, uh, could not have any Catholics, And there were restrictions on what they could do in terms of land and inheritance in all of these kingdoms, in fact. So over time, the remaining Catholic groups really lost a lot of their land and properties in England, Scotland, and especially Ireland. When Elizabeth died and James came to the throne, many Catholics hoped that he would be more sympathetic and would loosen these restrictions on Catholic rights. And it's not clear why they thought that. I mean, maybe because he was from Scotland and there was a larger proportion of Catholics in Scotland than there was in England. But for whatever reason, this was a widespread hope. But it didn't happen, right? James basically maintained the same policies as Elizabeth, and he was just as firm in his Protestant convictions, if not more so. And this created a great deal of consternation and frustration. And within the first few years of James's reign, networks of discontented Catholics formed. And some of them had sent money abroad to help persecuted Catholics against Protestant governments. Some numbers of them had even gone abroad and volunteered in wars where Catholics were fighting Protestant states, for instance, in the Netherlands, where uh, the, the southern Netherlands, which were mostly Catholic, were trying to overthrow uh, the rule of the Dutch Republic, which also suppressed Catholicism. And it seems some of them were radicalized in one way 
or another. And the, the parallels that one can see to today, where some people either grow up nominally Muslim or convert to Islam and then become radicalized and go support extremist groups abroad. Uh, there are a lot of parallels there. And in particular, one young man named Guy Fox, who was born and raised as a Protestant in England, converted to Roman Catholicism, went and joined these sort of volunteer paramilitary groups abroad fighting against the Dutch, and then came back and helped to organize a plot among several young Catholic extremists to overthrow King James, right, as kind of retribution for not ending the persecutions of Catholics. And the plan they came up with was actually pretty clever, <laughs> and it's sort of amazing from the point of view of today that it was possible and almost came to fruition. And what they figured out was that the big uh, meeting hall where sessions of parliament were held had an undercroft, so like an open basement story, where one could enter from street level. And it was open for rent. People could use it for storage or for market space. And so they decided to rent out this undercroft and then to little by little pack in barrels of gunpowder until eventually James came to open a session of parliament, at which point they would light a fuse and blow up the entire hall. Now, if this plot had succeeded, it would have, first of all, destroyed the building and probably all the facing buildings on surrounding blocks. It would have sent up tons of debris exploding into the air all around Westminster. It most likely would have killed everyone in the building. So that meant the king, most of his cabinet ministers, most of the high-ranking bishops of the Anglican Church, and all the members of the House of Lords and House of Commons. So most of the entire ruling class of England would have been slaughtered in this one explosion if it had happened. Now, this very well may have happened. Now, some historians will sort of dismiss this and say, oh no, the the conditions were damp and so the gunpowder was degraded and they'll say oh so therefore it was it wouldn't have exploded if they had uh, detonated it but that's actually not true if you ask military historians degraded gunpowder wasn't quite as good but it would still explode and experiments have shown it explodes so it this plot would have completely destroyed the government of England if it had been pulled off the reason it wasn't is that one of the conspirators happened to uh, have maybe a pang of conscience, and they wrote to a Catholic aristocrat who was a peer of the realm, meaning he was entitled to a seat in the House of Lords by virtue of his, his noble title. And he also was a Catholic recusant. And so this conspirator wrote to him and said, you know, I'm not going to tell you anything, but I'm going to advise you, if I were you, I wouldn't go to this opening of Parliament coming up next month. And this peer was troubled <laughs> and said, this seems very suspicious. I don't know what's going on. So he handed this letter over to the government. And so the royal court sent out investigators to look around, see if something was going on, if someone was maybe hiding in the Houses of Parliament. And they happened to catch Guy Fawkes walking out of the undercroft. Said, hmm, what's up here? What are you up to? And eventually figured out that he'd been stashing this gunpowder. And so the plot was foiled, and uh, it, it, no one was killed. So... The gunpowder plot is significant for a number of reasons. One is, you know, this weird parallel, really, with modern-day terrorism, right? It's very similar, you know, blow, blow up a building in, in order to destroy important people. But it was significant at the time because it caused shock and horror, right? And it reinforced many people's 
feeling that Catholicism was a sort of evil religion, a violent, repressive religion that was out to destroy the Protestant church and out to destroy England, really, right? So it reinforced this terror and and hatred of Catholics, which probably would have been 10 times worse had the plot succeeded, right? One can only imagine would there have been massacres, pogroms against Catholics. Uh, But it reinforced that sense, right? And it also demonstrated how even seemingly minor disputes over fine points of religious policy and politics could erupt into violence, right? And could threaten the very survival of the kingdom, right? And the entire system of government. So James was able to survive this kind of brush with disaster in the form of the gunpowder plot. And he reigned for another 20 years until 1625. His reign was reasonably successful. Okay, there was further colonization, further expansion of trade. However, a lot of the same political divisions continued, right? So you still had this tension and often power struggle between Puritans and high church Anglicans. You still had fear and controversy over the Catholic minority. You still had separatists and other uh, sort of extreme Protestants leaving the church. And you still had the rapid economic changes that caused so much stress and loss for many of the people in England, especially poorer rural people. So the enclosure movement continued, right? Lords, local governments continued to go in, seize common lands that had previously been open for anyone, and close them, sell off the plots. More and more people were losing uh, their sort of basic basis of survival in these common pastures and fields and woods. Uh, Many people hence became homeless, vagrants, uh, destitute, turned to theft, banditry, uh, although the largest number of them migrated into cities, especially into London, where they crowded into unhealthy and dangerous slums and had to look for work at dockyards, workshops, mills, wherever they could eke out a little bit of money to survive, right? So there was at the same time that there was prosperity for some from trade and from development of land and especially the the cloth industry, most people, it seems, suffered, right? And there was increasing poverty and anger, right? So in a sense, this rift that I talked about between high church and low church and between high church Anglicans and Puritans It was real and it was live, but it was also a distraction from what was happening materially to the majority of the people, right? And the loss of land, the loss of common land. So all of these problems and unresolved uh, tensions continued and came to a head after James died in 1625, and was succeeded by his son Charles, who became Charles I. So Charles I was a Protestant, but in other respects, he was very different from his father. So although he was a Protestant, he was very much a high church Anglican. He wanted the church to be beautiful and ceremonially rich and to glorify uh, both the the sacraments, and the crown, right? And he believed in a close alliance between uh, throne and altar, right? Between the the monarchy and the Church of England. Uh, He was much more sympathetic to Catholics and Catholicism. He actually, soon after coming to the throne, he married a French Roman Catholic princess named Henrietta Maria, and allowed her to bring her priests and to hear Catholic masses in private at the royal palaces like Whitehall and even in Westminster. So a lot of people who were anti-Catholic, who remembered the gunpowder plot, were really horrified by this idea of Catholicism coming right into the center of power. And Charles also had a very different philosophy of government. 
and he had much less respect or consideration for the parties in parliament and for negotiating or working out alliances in parliament. And this is very important, turned out to be tremendously important, right, for all the rest of British history. This becomes the sort of crucial moment of truth because parliament had been around for several hundred years. And it started out really just as a kind of typical medieval war council where the king, when he needed to wage war, would call together advisors from different elements of society, different regions, and enlist their support, right, in raising armies, waging war, raising taxes to pay for war. And in England, this didn't happen all that frequently because England is a very difficult country to invade. So there wasn't that much warfare going on. It was more just sporadic. And when kings like uh, Edward uh, did launch wars against Wales or Scotland, it was, of- it was often wars of aggression, right? It was, it was ambitions of either conquering or, or seizing the throne of neighboring countries like Wales and Scotland. And it could be controversial. It was important for the king to really get the support of the country, right? So there wasn't a sort of permanent power center with a permanent standing army or a big treasury like you might expect to see in France, for instance, or Castile. Rather, there was this custom that when the king was involved in warfare, he would call a parliament and get their permission and their support. And it happened more frequently sometimes and less frequently at other times. But in the 1600s, by the time Charles I comes to power, England is now becoming a serious international player, right, with a big navy and more uh, involvement in wars on the continent, wars involving France or Spain or their traditional ally, which was Portugal. Uh, which was a a Catholic country, also involvement in the wars in the Netherlands. So now this was more of a real live issue, right, of how much would the king be able to do? How much would he be able to set policy and make war and set war aims and raise money and create fleets and armies? And would he need parliament's permission and support to do this? So this was a very live issue. And Just after he comes to power, right, he marries Henrietta Maria, and then the following year, 1626, he gets England deeply involved in a war on the continent uh, in support, uh, nominally at least in support of Portugal, which was their ally, but also he starts to make moves, and his main general leading this war effort, the Duke of Buckingham, makes sort of quiet moves to support France and to give especially naval support to France in their own wars against the Huguenots, against the Protestant party within France. So now he seems to be taking, openly taking the side, or I should say covertly taking the side of a Catholic power against Protestants. So this causes huge outrage, and Parliament uh, is called, right, because because they have to raise money and armies, right? So Parliament meets, and they fire the Duke of Buckingham, okay? And in response, the king suspends Parliament, right? Basically says, I don't like what you're doing trying to thwart my authority in waging war. So he simply suspends them. So this is the first instance we see where Charles is using his power to disband Parliament to try to stop them from interfering in his policies. And after he suspends Parliament in 1626, he then also slowly begins a program of reforming the Church of England, replacing bishops, replacing priests, and trying to slowly move the doctrines of the church more in line with Catholicism, right? So it's becoming more clear that he really does want the Church of England to look more like a Catholic church. And this causes more consternation, naturally, especially among the Puritans, right? In 1628, the king is running out of money again. He needs more tax revenue 
So he agrees to call parliament again, right, to convene another parliament. And he tries to collect a ship tax, right? His, his hope is that he can charge a tax on sea traffic through the ports without parliament's permission, without even having to go through parliament. Uh, and this was considered a, a traditional prerogative of the king, right? This was one exception where the king could raise this tax without parliament approving it. But the ship tax is not enough. And he pressures parliament to raise and levy more taxes to give him the revenue he needs. But parliament uh, resists and forms a committee of grievances, which draws up a document they call a petition of right. Okay, where they basically say that uh, no taxation is allowed without Parliament's permission. And previously that had been sort of accepted that Parliament has to approve taxes, but now the ship tax issue is pushing, pushing things to the breaking point. So they, uh, they declare that they will not allow any taxation without Parliament's permission, and they basically force Charles to sign and agree to this document. Or, or else they will not allow any more revenue to fund his wars. And while this struggle is going on between the king and parliament, particularly the House of Commons, the Duke of Buckingham is assassinated. Right? Some lower-level officer takes it upon himself to kill the duke, uh, possibly because he feels it's necessary to protect the Protestant cause. And this sort of raises the stakes, and it raises the level of fear and distrust on both sides between Parliament and the King. But Parliament still holds fast to their demands, and they continue to issue statements condemning taxes uh, and also condemning the religious change, the reforms going on in the Church, and they reserve the right to, uh, to veto basically, any royal actions that change the teachings and practices of the church. So, again, the king suspends parliament. Right? So this is now becoming a pattern. The, the king is, is, does not accept these claims and suspends parliament. And, in fact, he prorogues parliament. And you may have heard this term lately in the news, because this is what the prime minister did, or strictly, technically speaking, what the queen just did at the insistence of the prime minister, and it was recently struck down by the courts. The courts, uh, first the Court of Session of Scotland and then the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, found that this was illegal because the prime minister and the monarch do not have the rightful authority, in their view, to suspend parliament for the purpose of blocking debate. And... Why did they find that? Well, they found that way because of the events I'm about to describe now. So King Charles prorogued Parliament in 1629 and never called it back together again for the next 10 years. So this is a period of what was called personal rule, where the king tried to manage the kingdom, the military, and taxation all without any approval or participation by Parliament, okay? And he furthermore ordered the arrest of three MPs, of three members of Parliament, who had led sort of the opposition against him and his policies. And when this caused controversy and opposition, he said, quote, princes are not bound to give account of their actions, but to God alone. So this is, you could say, a statement, it's certainly a statement of divine right. It's maybe, you could even say, a statement of absolute, a claim to absolute rule. Right? Kings, kings have the final say, and they're not accountable to any of their subjects, uh, only to, to God. So basically here, Charles was making an open statement that he saw himself as an absolute ruler on the model of France or Spain, right? And again, this only heightens the fear and the anger. And more and more his opponents in Parliament see uh, all of these things that they disapprove of as connected, 
and as centering on this one person of the king, right? This direct rule, the, uh, the levying of taxes by royal fiat, right? This uh, ignoring of parliament and Catholicism and even the changes in Protestant doctrine that made it more similar to Catholicism, right? They come to see tyranny and popery as essentially linked, right? Popery, uh, the, the religion of the Pope, is a religion of tyranny and of absolute rule. And all of this was then further confirmed a few years later in 1633, when the king appointed a priest named William Laud, as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. So the Archbishop of Canterbury is traditionally the highest ranking bishop of the Church of England and is basically like the monarch's uh, sort of minister of the church, you could say. And so Laud uh, becomes Archbishop and he embarks on an aggressive program to beautify and embellish the churches, right? Rather than looking like austere, reformed Protestant churches like you'd see in Switzerland, they come to look more and more like a Catholic church, embellished with, with tapestries and statues. And in particular, he insists on moving the communion tables where the Eucharist is performed or is, or is blessed, right? So the, the traditional Catholic teaching is that when you bless the Eucharistic host, it transubstantiates into the body of Christ. So it's an important miracle, and it's normally done in a, an altar that is recessed back in the chancel of the church, away from the congregants. And the priest performs this transubstantiation, often with his back turned, right, and reciting in Latin, right? It's something that's very mysterious, otherworldly. It's separated away from the ordinary people in the pews. Well, Reformed Protestants preferred to undo all of that and to take the communion table forward close to the people and to have it open, right, so everyone can see it directly, right? So there's a great symbolic significance in where and how you perform this sacrament, right? So Laud insisted on moving the communion tables back into the chancels again and setting up altar rails, sort of a symbolic barrier separating the chancel from the, the congregation, right? And high church Anglicans, many of them embraced this and considered this to be appropriate to inspire reverence in a sense of awe towards the miracle of the Eucharist. But it was, of course, anathema to, and, and infuri infuriating to Puritans. Laud also began to change the doctrines, okay? So he encouraged priests to, uh, to adopt Arminian theology, okay? And that's Arminian, A-R-M-I-N-I-A-N. Not Armenian like the country, but Arminian as in a, uh, a, a, an interpretation of Protestant theology that had been put, put forward by a Dutch theologian named Jacobus Arminius, and Arminianism rejected the idea of predestination. Okay, it said that uh, your your fate, whether you're saved or not, is not sealed outside of time by God. Rather, it's something that you can determine yourself. And in his view, in Arminius's view, uh, everyone is offered salvation. But if you fail to be good, if you fail to behave well, if you sin, you can lose it. So. This doctrine, you know, it is more similar to Catholic teaching than it is to Reformed Protestantism, and it puts a big emphasis on sort of good behavior, right? Being a good Christian, being a good churchgoer, which could be helpful or useful if you were in the elite of society, if you were, say, for instance, the king, and you wanted obedient and orderly subjects. This was you know, from your point of view, this could be an appealing sort of understanding of Christianity, right? But, of course, Puritans see this as, as heretic, heresy, right? As, as a violation of the basic Protestant doctrines of justification by faith and grace and a move back towards Catholic uh, corruptions, right? Right? 
So the struggle and the the distrust towards the king and the sense of being under siege, the sense of the king being uh, corrupt and controlled by evil ministers or evil foreign powers only grows and intensifies. And the following year, 1634, uh, the king again begins trying to charge ship money, right, to raise money without parliament, and continues this campaign for four years and even extends it inland and starts trying to collect ship money in inland towns where it had never been done before. And so the conflict escalates. Uh, A suit in court is is launched against the king on this point in 1638, but the king wins the suit, right? So even at this early date, courts are being used as an arena for uh, thrashing out the limits of the king's proper authority. And in that same year, in 1638, the king also began to move his program of church reform across the border into Scotland, right? He believed that the church in Scotland, which was Presbyterian and Calvinist, should look like the Church of England, right? It seemed natural to him. These were all his realms, and they should reflect his beliefs. So in 1638, he orders that the Book of Common Prayer should be used in the churches in Scotland, but... When uh, a minister in St. Giles Church in Edinburgh, right in the middle of Edinburgh, begins using the Book of Common Prayer, reportedly a lady stands up and throws her stool at him, and this triggers a riot, and soon uh, Protestant mobs go out and seize control of the streets, and a coup happens where a group of sort of Protestant rebels take control of the capital of Edinburgh. And the rebellion then spreads, and the the flashpoint in much of the country becomes whether you accept or reject the authority of the bishops. So the Church of Scotland was Presbyterian. It was it had always been governed by synods or gatherings of elders, but King James and Charles had appointed bishops to manage it in various areas of Scotland, especially the eastern coast. And so some people uh, joined this rebellion and basically tried to overthrow the bishops and seize control of the church, but others sided with the bishops. And you got a a, a split, a kind of low-level civil war between these Presbyterian rebels and Episcopalians, people who sided with the bishops. Okay. So different divides are being activated now, both in England and Scotland, right? And... What does the king do? Well, now he's really out of money. He's pushed the ship tax policy as far as he can. Uh, fighting breaks out between sort of local nobles who, who take sides in the conflict along the border between England and Scotland. And basically, the Scottish revolutionary government wins. Okay, the England is not mounting an effective opposition to put down this rebellion. So the king realizes his back is against the wall, and in order to raise an army and raise money from this kingdom where he has many opponents and critics, he again has to call parliament, and he has to somehow manage to get support out of a parliament. So he convenes parliament and uh, demands that they raise more taxes, but the parliament insists that they will not approve any new revenue unless the king first gives up on the ship tax. But the king simply says the opposite. It says, I won't give up the ship tax until you give me other sources of revenue first. So they're immediately at loggerheads. The king really, you know, is not good at managing conflicts at all. And so he simply dismisses parliament again. And so this parliament that met only for a few weeks in 1640 is called the short parliament. So... Again, the conflict along the border continues. The Scots make a lot of progress. They even start to cross the border and seize control of territories in England. And so in the fall of 1640, uh, Parliament is called again. And Parliament basically puts their foot down, abolishes ship money, sends out messages around England that no one should pay any ship money for the king, and halts the war with the Scots, basically orders the arrest 
of these sort of uh, vigilante English leaders who are trying to fight against the Scots. Okay, so they they more or less uh, freeze England in its tracks. And this parliament lasts much longer, so this is why it comes to be called the Long Parliament. And the Long Parliament basically is now so radicalized and so stacked with Puritans who are furious with the king, who have lost all trust in the crown government. And they, firstly, they declare that they can meet whenever they want and for however long they want. So this is a new development, that, that the, you do not have to wait for the monarch to convene a parliament, but parliament can convene itself and debate and operate of their own accord. Now, shortly after this long parliament makes this declaration, fighting also breaks out in Ireland. So people in Ireland are learning about these fights going on in Scotland and on the Scottish-English border and about the struggle between the king and the parliament. And there are many who sympathize with parliament, especially these Presbyterian settlers in Northern Ireland who many of whom come from Scotland are sympathetic to the Scottish uh, side. Uh, many of them are Presbyterian, like these Scottish rebels. And this sort of touches off the tensions between the different Protestant and Catholic groups in Ireland. You get a Catholic rebellion trying to sort of prevent these uh, Ulster Protestants from seizing control of Ireland. Catholic rebels seize a lot of the land, right? And again, the king is unable to manage the situation, either diplomatically or militarily. He, you know, is not a good commander. He has no money. And everything is spiraled out of his control. So parliament basically steps into the power vacuum and seizes control over war, over war and peace, and claims the authority to raise and command armies and sets this goal of sort of pacifying the three kingdoms, right? And in November of 1641, while all this fighting is going on, the, a group of radical MPs put forward what they call a grand remonstrance, which reads, you know, sort of similarly to the American Declaration of Independence, basically listing out all the crimes the king has committed against the Protestant religion, against the power and authority of parliament, and just condemns him completely as, as a tyrant and in, in almost, you might say, an illegitimate ruler, although they don't quite go that far, right? They still accept the, that the king is the king. So, in the following January, 1642, the king orders the arrest of six MPs for treason, okay? One peer in the House of Lords and five members of the House of Commons. So he accuses them of treason and sends orders for their arrest. But word of this action gets to Parliament. Parliament refuses the order, right? Says the king has no authority to, uh, to punish members of Parliament for things they have said in Parliament, right? You, a, a kind of early assertion of parliamentary privilege. And instead, they warn these six uh, accused MPs who flee and evade arrest. Okay, and once word of this gets out from Westminster to the rest of the country, it sends the signal that people really have to take sides, that this is starting to come to blows, right? And that civil war may be approaching. So people have to make open declarations of what side they're on in support of parliament or the king, right? And many people, especially Puritan-leaning people around the south and east of England, uh, make statements in support of parliament against particularly against popery, right? They kind of consider this the sort of ultimate antichrist enemy behind all of their problems is, is popery. So the king sees that he is losing the loyalty of many of his subjects, especially around the area of London, right? Which is where he and the royal family live. And so he removes his family from the Palace of Whitehall to Hampton Court, a more defensible rural palace. 
And he sends the queen, Henrietta Maria, abroad. And she goes to the continent in order to try to make diplomatic contacts, gain support for the royals, and to sell or pawn some of the crown jewels to raise money and buy arms for a war. Right? So it's clear the direction things are going in. And while that's happening, Parliament similarly makes important strategic moves. And for one, they, Parliament takes command of the militias, right? There, there's no real permanent standing army anywhere in Britain. It's just not something they have. Rather, they have locally organized militias, which traditionally reported to, to the king through lords' lieutenants, sort of appointed royal commanders of the different militias. But Parliament seizes control of these militias, and Charles uh, himself has to basically retreat into a part of the country where he has more support. And so he moves and takes his headquarters to York, right? this kind of traditional, almost second capital in the north of England. And from York, he tries to seize control of naval forces and arms in the ports around England and Scotland, but is not very successful, right? Parliament kind of beats him to the punch. And so once Charles has retreated and is in York, Parliament puts forward a proposal for a new constitution. And this, under this new constitution, Parliament would be recognized as the supreme authority, right, the ultimate authority, uh, with control over arms and warfare, control over the church, and the right to appoint or remove officials like judges and ministers. Right? So in effect, all real governing power would be in parliament, and the king would be reduced mainly to a figurehead. Now, there's an irony here about this, in that this was a pretty radical proposal at that time, right? It was going much further than anyone had ever seen in, even within England, much less in the rest of Europe, right, where parliaments tended to just be sort of advisory and judicial bodies. So this was a radical idea that supporters of the king really could not accept, and yet it's almost exactly what has actually come about, <laughs> right? This is more or less what we see as the status quo today, right? And although this uh, constitution failed at the time, and although the gains that were made during the ensuing civil war were reversed, eventually over time, power shifted to the point where really it's commonly known in Britain today that the king is just a figurehead and that real governing power is in the House of Commons. Okay, so there's an irony there. But, but Charles had many supporters, okay? There were many people who distrusted Parliament and who distrusted the Puritans, who now dominated the House of Commons, and who saw them as kind of greedy, grasping, you know, bourgeois merchants and lawyers, who had no respect for the traditional rights and prerogatives of the church, of the aristocracy, and of their duties to the peasantry, right? This was a, this was a, a huge point of contention, and there were many people who had favorable sort of relationships with the church and with their landlords or with local nobles who tried to protect and support the rural life in their regions against enclosure, right, and against rack renting. Okay, so there were various parties, especially in the north and west of England, and also to some degree in Scotland and Ireland as well, who rallied to the king, and, and Catholics as well, saw, you know, their fortune as tied to the king as against the Puritans. So the king saw that in order to stop this seizure of power by parliament, he had to raise an army. And he had to do it not through parliament, but by going directly to the people, to his supporters in the country at large. So in August 1642, Charles raised the royal standard at Nottingham, at this you know old rural town, almost right in the middle of England. 
and began gathering a makeshift army of his supporters. And Parliament then responded in kind, right? So they raised the standard of Parliament and began gathering their own uh, armies and militias. And the different groups who uh, rallied to these two sides had different social profiles, obviously, right? And they came to be called by sort of, uh, you know, half-mocking informal nicknames. So those who rallied to the royal cause tended to be largely rural, traditional nobles and aristocrats who liked to ride on horses and act like knights. And they were called cavaliers, right? Or horsemen, right? And then those who rallied to parliament tended to be a lot of middle class or small landowners and to have more sort of austere, respectable, Puritan kind of taste. Uh, Cavaliers might have long hair, while the supporters of parliament had short cropped hair, and so they were called roundheads. So this is where you get these sort of archetypes of cavaliers and roundheads. And these two sides engaged in a long, fairly brutal and destructive civil war from 1642 to 46. So a civil war basically similar in length to the American Civil War. And there was a whole long series of battles and skirmishes with the different sides gaining small strategic points, gaining bits of territory back and forth, right? I won't get into the details. But Parliament tended to have more strength and control more territory in the South and East, including London, whereas the King controlled more of the North and the West. And sort of each summer, when the weather allowed, Local groups, militias, would go at each other, struggle over towns, fortresses, and it seemed like more or less a stalemate for a while. But things started to shift first in August 1643 when the Scots rode in across the border in support of the Roundheads, right? Uh, Sympathizing more with Parliament and what they saw as the Puritan cause. And these Scottish rebels made a so-called solemn league and covenant, or a kind of religious alliance, with the Puritans in Parliament. And part of the uh, terms of this solemn league and covenant was that once they had secured control of England and Scotland, then Parliament would reform the Church of England along the same lines as the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. So in a way, the Solemn League and Covenant was sort of like a a response, a a mirror image response to Charles's attempt to reform the Church of Scotland to look like the Church of England, right? These, These covenanters wanted to reverse that process and instead make the Church of England a Presbyterian Calvinist church. So they've sealed this uh, Solemn League and Covenant, and the following year, they began to win more significant victories. So in June 1644, at the Battle of Marston Moor, Parliament won its first uh, big victory. And in particular, they were able for the first time to counter the superior cavalry of the royalists, right? That had been the big advantage, right? And part of why they were called cavaliers. But by the end of 1644, that advantage has been neutralized. And then in January 1645, during a sort of winter respite, Parliament forms the New Model Army, where they consolidate forces from all around the country into one large uh, army that can travel and is equipped and ready and authorized to fight and engage the enemy anywhere around the country. And it is intentionally led by full-time trained fighters and experienced professionals who are promoted on the basis of performance, not political connections. And that's part of why one of the rules of the New Model Army was that no one, no officer in the army could be a member of parliament, right? So there was a separation between political deal-making, and the management of this army. And in a lot of ways, this new model army became kind of the first modern military force, really the, the, the model, you know, like the, like the name says, the model for later modern military units. 
And in June 1645, the New Model Army won its first major victory at Naseby, and most of the Royalist infantry was killed, right? Cavalry could retreat, but most of the infantry was killed in this battle. The king saw that he was in grave danger and retreated to Oxford, which was one of the few sort of royalist strongholds left in England after this point. Incidentally, uh, if you if you aren't aware, Oxford is more or less directly west of London, closer to the West Country, whereas Cambridge is sort of north northwest of London, more in the kind of East Anglia region above London. And those two universities had different social profiles. And basically, the high church Anglicans, the traditional gentry, they favored Oxford, whereas Puritans were concentrated at Cambridge, right? So there's this long kind of social split between Oxford and Cambridge. And that kind of came into play during the Civil War when Oxford served as the main lasting holdout of the royalist cause in England. So the king initially uh, retreats to Oxford, uh, but then continues to try to fight in the north uh, where his stronghold is, but is defeated and surrenders to the Scottish rebels. The Scots take him prisoner. While he is being held prisoner, uh, Oxford, the sort of last royalist capital in exile, surrenders to parliament. So basically, at this point, the war is effectively over. And the question now is what's going to happen to the king and the church and to everyone who supported the royalist cause. So the following year, in 1647, the Scots hand the king over to the English parliament, and he is held in house arrest at a manor house in Northamptonshire. And while he is held prisoner there, the army meets at Putney, at this sort of outlying village near London, and holds a series of debates over what sort of country England will be. And different members of the army, even though they had all fought on the parliamentarian side, had very radically different visions of what the war meant and of what should happen next. Should there be a king or not? Should Parliament have total power? Should it have more power? Who should be represented in Parliament? Who should be able to vote? Who should control the church? Who should control the land? All of these things were up in the air, and all of these festering conflicts that had been going on all through these years and that had helped to create the Civil War now sort of exploded in these Putney debates. And... Many of the lower-level soldiers who came from more modest backgrounds, maybe minor merchants or laborers, they wanted more drastic change, and they wanted to see England become a more equal society. They wanted these powers and prerogatives of the aristocracy and the upper class and the bishops to be abolished, basically, and to become a more uh, equal, more democratic society. And so these more radical soldiers were called levelers, right? They become a sort of semi-organized party. And the leaders of the levelers put forward a petition called the Agreement of the People. And this Agreement of the People, which was submitted in the Putney Putney debates, uh, warned that they wanted to avoid the danger, quote, of returning into a slavish condition. They didn't want to go back to inequality and subjection like they had always known before the war. And they wanted to protect their rights and liberties. Okay, They used that phrase, rights and liberties. Now, they didn't necessarily say uh, civil rights or natural rights, the kind of phrases that are used in later centuries. They didn't argue that these rights were inherent to everyone as human beings. But they argued that these were rights that they deserved and that went back to the ancient customs of England and that should be protected against tyranny, right? And they put forward a manifesto that demanded certain political changes, right? They wanted to see uh, 
parliaments convened and elected every two years, right? No long parliaments, but rather parliaments that were frequently elected and more responsive to the people. They wanted uh, parliament to have ultimate control over laws and taxes and warfare. They wanted the districts in parliament to be apportioned equally, right? So something more like one man, one vote, as opposed to what happened previously where rural districts with very few people might have more representatives in parliament than, say, London with hundreds of thousands of people. And they wanted equal proportionment so that all people in all parts of the country and all classes would have voices in parliament. And they further argued that there should be limits on the power of government, even of parliament, right? that there, there should be certain spheres of life kept outside of government power completely. And that included, for one, freedom of religion. So they argued that the, the government should withdraw its support from the Church of England and simply allow religious freedom. Uh, they wanted an end to censorship, and they wanted to abolish uh, the draft, Okay, that no one should ever be conscripted into an army. And they say at one point in this, in this agreement, they say, uh, the matter of impressing and constraining any of us to serve in the wars is against our freedom, and therefore we do not allow it in our representatives. The rather because money, which is the sinews of war, being always at their disposal, they can never want numbers of men apt enough to engage in any just cause. So that's sort of, you know, old-fashioned language that might sound convoluted, but basically they're saying, look, Parliament has access to money, they can pay people, and they'll always be able to raise an army if it's a just cause. There will always be volunteers willing uh, to serve, so there should not be any conscription. No one should be forced into an army. And lastly, they insist that uh, all people should be equal before the law, right? And there should be... Uh, in all laws made or to be made, every person may be bound alike, and no tenure, estate, charter, degree, birth, or place do confer any exemption from the ordinary course of legal proceedings whereunto others are subjected. Right? So everyone is treated equally regardless of their title or class. So the levelers you can see as kind of the party pushing for the most thorough political change that was feasible or imaginable at that time. But most levelers still did not necessarily address the questions of control of land, right? Enclosure of the commons, and of wealth, right? Of who, who has access to money in the form of rents or profits made off of land. And probably part of the reason why a lot of levelers kind of left that out was that some of them were landowners, right? And they didn't really want to see their property rights uh, challenged or called into question. So during the Putney debates, you see people of different classes sort of struggling over what parliament should do next now that the king is effectively neutralized. But the conversation ends up being cut short because... King Charles escaped from the manor house where he was being held and manages to flee secretively to the Isle of Wight, an island on the Channel coast of England where he has some supporters and protectors. And so now, in a way, the, it seems as if the civil war might restart and Parliament has to send out agents to, to locate him and to recapture him, which they do in December 1648. So now this creates another crisis because during the Putney debates, people had been assuming that they could negotiate or force some agreement upon the king and create a new political order in which the king was a figurehead. But now those people who support that approach kind of have egg on their faces because the king has shown that he will simply thumb his nose at parliament all over again and probably was trying to flee abroad to raise allies in Catholic Europe. So this whole process gets blown up, 
And in January 1649, Oliver Cromwell seizes control of Parliament. So Cromwell was a dyed-in-the-wool Puritan. He had served in Parliament previously, and he had also served as a high-level officer in the New Model Army and was seen as a war hero by many of the soldiers. And so by January 1649, he is back in Parliament, and he is sort of one person who has the respect and the influence to seize control of a majority in the House of Commons and expel all those in the House who still favored negotiating a settlement with the king. So this creates what was called the Rump Parliament, a parliament that is basically entirely Puritan, that has a large portion of radical Puritans and a large portion of levelers, and that basically has decided they do not want to respect the king's prerogatives at all anymore. Right? They are radicalized. So they make a series of declarations, including declaring that Parliament has the authority to pass laws without royal assent. Right? The, the, the king no longer has any authority to veto acts or legislation of Parliament. They abolish the House of Lords. Right? <laughs> Don't need it. <laughs> It came back later, you probably know, but they abolished the House of Lords and they create a special court to try the king for treason, right? They basically say that by escaping from his house arrest and trying to flee abroad, he has committed treason against the realm. The court condemns him as a man of blood, which is a phrase from the Bible, and he is executed by beheading on January 30th. 1649. And Parliament then declares a free commonwealth, right, which is a sort of generic term for a sort of republic or self-governing state without a king. So this makes the Rump Parliament a group of regicides, right? It makes them, uh, it horrifies Europe. It makes them anathema to the various royal governments all around Europe because they have committed this ultimate crime and in, in, in their view, this ultimate treason of turning against and killing their own king. So the execution of Charles I begins an 11-year interregnum. And this is the sort of you know Latin term that people use in retrospect, this period between the kings, right? With no formal king on the throne. And I won't talk about the whole interregnum, but I'll just talk a little bit about what happened at the very beginning, right? At this sort of ultimate, you might say, most extreme radical moment of the English Civil War. So with the declaration of a free commonwealth, uh, the church is disestablished, there's religious freedom, censorship is stopped, publication of all kinds of ideas is now allowed. And there's a sort of outpouring of radicalism, right? Oppositional ideas that maybe had been percolating under the surface for decades or for centuries even, maybe going back to the Tudor age, now sort of burst forth. And we can see what a lot of people were actually thinking and doing now that they had an opportunity and now that there was this kind of window of possibility of what would happen to English society. A lot of people in the lower classes seized this opportunity to try to reverse enclosures and evictions, right? People moved back onto common lands, tore down walls and hedges, seized control of what they knew as the commons, went back to lands where they had had tenancies and began occupying and farming them again, right? So for a lot of people, this seemed like the natural next step, that now they should be free to, to go back, right? To go back to the previous order of things. And in the view of some, this was simply a return to the correct order of the world as it had been before this tyranny had begun. And many of these people were called diggers. It's not entirely clear. Different sources are not totally consistent on why they were called that. Was it because they were digging trenches to fight or they were digging out hedges or they were far just because they were farming and plowing? But for whatever reason, many of these people were called diggers. 
who reseized control of land. And one particular large group of diggers uh, joined together in a sort of communal organization and took control of the common lands on St. George's Hill in Surrey, right, in southern England, south of London. And their kind of unofficial ringleader was a radical Puritan named Gerard Winstanley. And Winstanley had been a religious radical, and he had a kind of utopian philosophy. And his utopianism mixed together different ideas and traditions. On the one hand, Anglo-Saxonism, the notion that England should return back to the traditional norms and laws of the Anglo-Saxon past before the Norman invasion, right? So he believed that they should throw off the Norman yoke, in his view, and also Christian millennialism, the idea that a new purified Christian faith would change the world and would open an age of, of peace and equality, right? So he was, uh, you know, blending these kind of legal and political and religious ideas. And together with his supporters and allies on St. George Hill, he issued a declaration in June 1649, which he called a declaration from the poor oppressed people of England, directed to all that call themselves or are called lords of manners. So he sees this as a statement of the views and interests and rights of the poor as against the nobility and as against landowners. And just to give you a sense of how radical this declaration was, I'll, I'll start by just reading you some of the first paragraph where the diggers say, quote, uh, we whose names are subscribed do in the name of all the poor oppressed people in England declare unto you that call yourselves lords of manners and lords of the land that in regard the king of righteousness our maker hath enlightened our hearts so far as to see that the earth was not made purposely for you to be lords of it and we to be your slaves, servants, and beggars but it was made to be a common livelihood to all without respect of persons. So you see here, they're making this religious argument that the, the earth was created by God to be occupied by all of humankind and not simply of lords of manners. And they go on to specifically spell out what they mean legally. They say, quote, Your buying and selling of land and the fruits of it one to another is the cursed thing. For the power of enclosing land and owning propriety was brought into creation by your ancestors by the sword, which first did murder their fellow creatures, men, and after plunder and steal away their land, and left this land successfully to you, their children. So they're attacking the very notion that anybody has the right to ownership of land. And they argue that this only came about originally by violence. Uh, and this is what created what they call propriety, or as we would say today, property, right? Property was created by the sword, and hence then has been passed down through the generations. And they go on, the declaration is very repetitive, they repeat these and elaborate on these points, but I'll just go on to just a couple paragraphs later, they, they make an even finer point, saying, Though you and your ancestors got your propriety by murder and theft, and you keep it by the same power from us that have an equal right to the land with you, by the righteous law of creation. Yet we shall have no occasion of quarreling about that disturbing devil called particular propriety. For the earth, with all her fruits of corn, cattle, and such like, was made to be a common storehouse of livelihood to all mankind, friend and foe, without exception. So this might sound, although it is in a strange old-fashioned language, it might sound a little eerily familiar the way they reject the very notion of particular propriety. And as many people have pointed out, it forms a kind of precursor to Marx, right? And Marx's critique of private property, which is basically just a different phrase for the same thing, the same basic legal principle. Uh, and in a way, you could see these diggers as kind of 17th century communists, right? There's no clear reason not to describe them uh, 
that way, even though that word didn't exist yet, right? But in this way, you can see this conflict over questions that lay beneath the political machinations and factions in parliament, questions about wealth, land, control of land, enclosure, uh, that they found moments to explode out into the political scene during this interregnum. And the diggers, not surprisingly, caused a certain degree of shock and consternation in Surrey, where they had seized control of, uh, of George's Hill. And local people complained to Parliament, basically saying, you have to suppress this. And some of the local people, especially landowning gentry, were very threatened by this kind of radical commune springing up in their midst. As all of this madness was sort of exploding, eventually Parliament did send uh, representatives and inspectors, and they found that this group, in their view, was harmless, that what they were doing was not a clear threat to the Commonwealth. But Gerard Wynne Stanley and his closest allies persisted, and they began in the winter of 1649 and 50 to travel around England finding sympathizers, right? Other radical levelers, or as he called them, true levelers, who agreed with their kind of communist views and started to build a network of people calling for both political equality and economic equality through common ownership of property. So I'm going to leave off there and say, you know, this sort of radical winter of 1649 to 50, you can see as kind of an extreme moment, right, in this whole ongoing constitutional crisis in England, right? And I'll leave till later what happened, right? What became of this? And how were these swirling questions and uncertainties gradually resolved? And how did that eventually lead to the weird, complicated constitutional landscape that we see now in the UK, right? And that, to understand that, you have to go through the rest of what happened to the Stuart dynasty. But we can't go through all of that now, but I'll just point out that in a lot of ways, these disputes about what can the prime minister do, what did he tell the queen, <laughs> Was he truthful? Was it legitimate? Who has the power to do what? Who has the power to stop what? And is England in some way a democracy or should it be a democracy? Right? That's a sort of weird, ambiguous, unresolved question hanging over this entire situation in Britain. Right? So hopefully uh, I'll be able to take up more of that later, but I wanted to establish uh, this about what happened in the first place that led to the Civil War, and also in order to tell more of the political and social background of England in the 1600s so I can also then address Shakespeare, because I, I want to talk about Shakespeare as well and who he was or was not and how does he fit into this history. So again, uh, if you can, please go to my Patreon page and uh, support in any way you can. You'll have access to my patron-only lectures. Uh, probably at least one of mine about Shakespeare will be patron-only. And as I have said before, if, if I get up to 75 patrons, that's my next goal, then I can guarantee that I'll produce at least three lectures uh, a month, and they will be you know, more reliable and dependable. So please go and support in any way you can, even if it's just a dollar. Thank you.